Tathagata Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami Oh, I'm just curious, maybe a show of hands survey um, for people who uh, maybe tried experimenting with that uh, more subject-based awareness or that awareness of empty space we were trying to, trying to get to. Um, how about, so did it make sense for people? Maybe get a show of hands who people are like, yes, I can follow you, it makes sense. And how about people who are like, what is this guy talking about? <laughs> yeah, got a few of those? All right, good. Um, yeah, this uh, way of kind of directing the mind is, um, yeah, something which uh, can be conceived of as um, like the non-dual. So non-duality is often framed, it's, it's oftentimes associated with, um, with Mahayana Buddhism or even with, with Hinduism. Like the, uh, the word, English word non-dual is basically a direct translation from Advaita. So a uh, meaning not, dve or dvai, the state of being not dve, dv or tw, two, not being two. So that's... Yeah, Advaita basically is teaching this uh, exactly of non-dual. Uh, but you do find a Pali uh, correlate, so like Pali Buddhism, that's basically what Theravada Buddhism, Thai Buddhism, Sri Lankan, Burmese, uh, that's what Ajahn Nisabo and I are most familiar with. Um, and you don't often hear this, this term or this concept, or this way of meditating of non-duality, non-dualism um, come up in such circles. but. It does appear. You do find the word advayang, which is the rough Pali equivalent of advaita, come up in the uh, Pali texts, the Theravada texts. And uh, it's interesting to look at how it appears. So it appears not as like a philosophical, um, what's called like ontological. It's not a statement of the way things are. You know, it's not meant to be some kind of doctrine. You can say, I know the truth, everything's non-dual, so I'm right, you're wrong about whatever. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's not meant to be some kind of thing you can latch on to as um, a truth statement, but in the polytext, it's more experiential and more pragmatic. Like there's a, perf uh, there's a, uh, a way to direct the mind in a way which is non-dual, in a way which, uh, erases, relaxes, softens up um, the dualism between subject and object, or even between internal or, or external. Uh, sometimes in English use, or in some of these other schools that talk about non-dualism, uh, it's, it's oftentimes vague or really used in, it's to catch all, like everything is non-dual. Um, and, uh, yeah, when with such vague or kind of broad statements, it's like, what do you what do you do with that? Um, but on a pragmatic level, as it's spoken of in a Theravada context, which is what is trying to um, see if we can tap into with that guided meditation, um, it's a skillful means. So uh, there are some script uh, scriptures, not in the Theravada, but which say samsara and nibbana are the same thing. There's no dualism. There's samsara, nibbana, or the worldly and the transcendent, they're the same thing. Uh, Theravada doesn't go there, but there is this uh, way of directing the mind which really plays around with distinctions of subject and object, uh, distinctions, hard and fast distinctions, which basically we've been uh, adopting and holding on to just from biological 
necessity from the time of birth. I mean, everything just seems like, okay, it's me in here behind my eyes, like looking out at the world, um, and that's out there. So there's here, this is the subject, and there's out there, there's the object. Um, so that's just the mode that we're all, all used to. Um, but yeah, you can uh, see in meditation that um, that distinction is much less, uh, much less uh, strict, much less concrete, and um, that there is yeah, a lot of wiggliness around the, the boundaries of these things. And why is that uh, important? Um, other than perhaps just being interesting, um, it can help us with the three main trainings of, of Buddhism. So in Buddhism, we talk about the training of virtue or the training of ethics. We talk about the training of the mind, the uh, citta bhavana, uh, the citta sikha, and you talk about the uh, training of wisdom. So we're training our bodily conduct. That's the training of, of body. How do we give up all those sucky habits that we are stuck on? And how do we, how do we uh, inculcate and engender and really make a part of our lives all the good habits that we want to do but can't yet um, make habit, can't yet really bring into uh, reliable manifestation? And this, um, yeah, this, uh, this method can help also with, uh, yeah, training the mind and training wisdom. So maybe just to go back to what I'm talking about, this uh, felt sense of uh, the non-distinction between um, inner and outer or this more spacious awareness. So, um, yeah, you can do it with your eyes open, but it's a bit easier to um, really feel into the, uh, the first person non-distinction of self and object, internal and external, when you have your, your eyes closed. So in the Satipatthana Sutta, the main Buddha's main discourse on teaching mindfulness that everybody in all schools of Buddhism accept, which is very down to earth, nothing magical or um, too, there's not too many asks in that sutta. It basically says, pay attention to the breath or pay attention to the body, pay attention to the feelings internally, or pay attention to the body or the breath or the sensations externally, or pay attention to the body or the breath or sensations externally and internally. So doing both at the same time. And training in this. Um, so in that guided meditation, seeing if you can drop your attention, drop your awareness, drop the locus of self or the locus of awareness from this really brainy, heady, thinking-oriented way that most people, I think, operate in the world. It's like just me behind my eyes and just uh, see if you can detach from that uh, over-fixed, brow-beating kind of um, vector of always going, always going out, um, but just yeah, drop that, and then just drop into this, this heart center, like feeling, knowing the world from the center of the heart, and then uh, when the mind has dropped in that sense, you can kind of uh, include, so rather than just saying that um, it's ridiculous that the mind could know anything outside of the body, um, yeah, just uh, not even going to that side of things, but just saying, okay, it, it really feels like I can't feel where the skin stops, yet it's not a clear line. One would think you look at a, a child's drawing of a human, and you got these black lines surrounding, okay, it's pretty clear, this is internal, this is external, um, but our felt sense of self, felt sense of subject from the inside, is not at all black and white, internal, external. Uh, you would think from a drawing like that, that you would, in your mind's eye, just go out to the end of the skin, and then it's almost like, uh, you know, the, it's like you're knowing from the inside of a tennis ball, and then you reach the rubbery outside of that inside of a tennis ball, and you're like, okay, that's, that's the inside, outside, 
of the inside of that tennis ball. Um, but that's not how it feels when you're inside of, of the body. And um, again, this isn't just uh, something which is uh, curious and nonsensical, but it's a way of certainly of training attention, training flexibility of mind, which <laughs> if we haven't gotten our minds around uh, the importance of flexibility of mind, uh, we should do that uh, like, like soon. Um, I mean, one, one thing you t hear talked about in uh, Pali texts is yoniso manasikara, um, which is uh, intelligent or wise attention. Uh, yoniso means basically uh, wise or literally that which goes to the foundation, to that which goes to the deepest truth. And manasikara, kara is related to karma or doing, and mana is related to, to mind. So we are wisely doing the action of the mind or another, that's all one word in Pali. Um, but you can sh think of it as the capacity to shift, to mentally shift. And this is really important. Uh, being locked into our perceptions, uh, locked into our worldviews, locked into our uh, opinions, it just sucks. And even if you don't realize that it sucks for you, it sucks for the people around you. Yeah, because, uh, <laughs> you know, it just uh, is not pleasant to interact with people who can't get out of their own mind, you know, and, and uh, see the world from other people's perspectives. And so what we're doing f physically, uh, <laughs> in a sense, or at least the felt inner sense, is training in flexibility of mind. Literally, where is the mind knowing from? And this is a question which um, certainly none of us were taught in school, um, but is a real thing you can do. Um, and when you realize that you can do this, you can, the mind is knowing from someplace, some, for the most part, I think most people most of the time are so obsessed with the objects uh, visually that we see for the most part that we're just so used to going out and just labeling the distinctions between the things that we see outside. Everything is so flashy. I mean, I don't know if you guys have it on this wall, but I mean, literally these flashy lights, you know, everything is drawing our attention. Um, you know, advertisements, the whole world, uh, even, you know, in pre, you know, before the advent of electricity, you know, still the world is exciting outside. There's so many things which seem so much more exciting than um, what seems like a dull, boring inner world for, for many of us. Um, so we're so fascinated, literally fastened on to the things outside that we don't even realize that we're notice we, where that knowing is coming from. Yeah, so there's this vector. This is a, a mathematical geometric term which basically talks about the directionality of something. The directionality of a line pointing this way, an arrow. Um, we're so used to looking to what the arrows are pointing to, looking at the moon, that we don't even realize what is at the beginning, uh, the seeming beginner, the center of that vector. Um, so looking at uh, awareness, looking at the subject, that which is knowing. Um, so that's radical. But then realizing that you can actually shift where that's knowing. You don't have to notice, you don't have to know the world from the retina or wherever it is that, um, you know, we're latching onto the world to, you can drop awareness. And that's great because we're not used to doing that. And when you habitually see the world from a different space, uh, experience the world from a different part of the body, you know, this is exactly analogous to why it's useful uh, to go on vacation, why it's useful to uh, go to school, why it's useful to get out of your normal environment and go somewhere else, go live in another country for a period of time and just see that not everyone sees the world that you, the same way that you see it. Uh, you, can, you can experience the world from a different place. And similarly, when you train to drop awareness and experience from the heart center or really anywhere, so no pressure, if, you know, if this, what I'm saying makes sense at all, uh, that 
you can know the world from somewhere else in the body, but for whatever reason, you're like, don't like the center of the heart. Uh, I wanna know the world from, uh, from the abdomen or from the dantian, which is a, you know, it's talked about in Chinese medicine or in Qigong, Tai Chi, this knowing the center from just below the, the belly button. These different chakras are points from which you can know the world. Or, uh, yeah, so no pressure to know the, the world from the heart center, but wherever you choose to experiment knowing the world from, uh, this is a training. And uh, when you habitually learn to see the world, experience the world from a different spot, take that uh, subject, that different location as your object, uh, then you're seeing the world through different through a different lens, um, and that's that's good to at least at least shake you up and um, yeah you're you're seeing the world from a different spot and um, this helps yeah as I mentioned the training in uh, in precepts or training in bodily habit or habits of of speech um, when we're so used to only experiencing the world, to interacting and communicating with the world from a particular subject, from a particular uh, spot, as I've been mentioning, kind of behind the eyes, through the eyes, uh, then we've got all sorts of habits of speech and body that are uh, affiliated with that uh, center of knowing, that locus of awareness. Um, so our habits of unskillful speech um, our habits, our mental habits of feeling uncomfortable or social anxiety. Oh my gosh, social anxiety. Uh, yeah, if you don't experience it, I don't recommend it. If you do experience it, um, you'll know that, yeah, finding some relief, that, that is a form of suffering. You know, it is a, a very felt sense of, of suffering. And a lot of that is associated um, deeply with where we're knowing the world from. And when you kind of drop awareness, again, I'm just using the heart center as the place to know the world from, it's just so much easier to interact with, with people. You're, you're seeing people in a different way. Um, and there's just less habitual uh, energy bound up with, with anxiety when you shift where you're knowing the world from. Uh, in that way. So I don't have to follow, I'm less inclined to follow my unhelpful, uh, unwholesome habits of speech when I'm uh, yeah, able to know the world from a different angle and, as I've been mentioning, this uh, non-dual to really play around with, with this perception of, yeah, where is the boundary between internal and external? Like on one level, <laughs> Everything that I'm seeing from a subjective first point of point person point of view is actually occurring in my own head. So this point at the tip of my finger, say any point in this room, you know, four feet in front of me, four feet in front of you, two feet to the right, six feet up, that point, wherever it is in the room, is actually occurring inside of your, your own consciousness, inside of your own head. And um, yeah, so you get to when you feel that, when you feel that, um, okay, I can't actually feel where the skin stops. You know, there's not this uh, latex, you know, boundary, um, you know, skin or suit, which is constricting my awareness, that things are more permeable than that. Awareness is capable of, uh, yeah, not seeing a fixity there. Um, then, yeah, that can help your, um, it can shake up your, your habits and um, yeah, hopefully in a, a positive way because you've got less associations coming to the world from this spot. Training on the mind, yeah, typically when you talk about chitta bhavana or the development of the mind, uh, most meditation objects that people take in the West for sure are um, somewhat related to as if they were external. So even as if we're, even when we're paying attention to the breath, which is an internal function, um, you can subtly be relating to it uh, 
from somewhere else. So I'm watching the breath at the tip of the nose or at the abdomen or even in the whole body from a, a little knower, like a homunculus, a little knowing behind the eyes. Um, but you don't have to do that. Um, you can know the breath at the tip of the nose from the tip of the nose. You can be the breath. You don't have to watch the breath. You don't have to pang is a, a Thai word which is often used to talk about the way you develop um, samadhi or develop or meditation, which literally it's like to, to focus or to, um, to almost to stare at your meditation object. And that is just really constricting when you do it too much. Um, you can often, many people, after a time taking the breath, they might find that uh, they actually don't like the breath because they're relating to it in this constricted, tight, uh, othering, directed, object, objective way, objectified way. Uh, but you can be the subject with the breath or with any other object. Um, so that's how training in non-duality, training in spaciousness, training in being able to drop awareness uh, can itself be a meditation object, you take the knowing, the puru, that which is the knowing, the knower, consciousness as the object. Um, so that's how non-duality can be a samatha or a tranquility or a concentration, samadhi, object. And in terms of the, the training of mind uh, or chit, uh, panya bhavana, excuse me, the training of wisdom, uh, this is typically framed in terms of knowing the anicca, dukkha, and anatta reality of existence, the impermanent, not self, and unsatisfactory nature of all existence, uh, or of, yeah, it, and it's, it really is a uh, explore for yourself kind of thing. Don't take, you don't have to take anybody else's word for it, just explore um, the are things really substantial and permanent? Is anything internal or external substantial or permanent? Is anything external, internal self? Is anything external or internal permanently satisfying all the time? And when you feel with awareness, specifically at the heart, you feel, you can feel anicca, you can feel impermanence, the vibratory nature of anatomy of a human body it's right there. I'm, you're feeling, I mean, depending on what you're looking at from this, this heart center, you can feel the blood in your heart. You can feel your heart throbbing. You can feel your lungs gently compacting in and out onto the lungs. All of that is screaming impermanence, impermanence. Um, or even on a, a subtler level, like on a you know, vibration level, because oftentimes, uh, depending on how you're looking from the heart. You're not looking at the blood coursing through the coronary arteries or pushing through the different uh, ventricles, the different parts of the, the heart, um, but you're just feeling this vibration. Yeah, this, and it's just like the song of the, the universe, the, uh, this constant um, hum, this vibration, this trill, um, in the car coming here this morning, we were talking about the, uh, like the Spanish R, like the R kind of noise. And um, you just feel that, that trill uh, in the heart, the inner felt sense of a human body, wherever you're knowing it from, from the center of the heart, from your hands, feel the palms of your hands right now from the inside. And it's just trilling. It's just trilling out right there. Um, so very tangibly, uh, palpably, you can, you're feeling anicca, the truth of impermanence, and uh, that's a training in wisdom. As far as the truth of not-self, or the, uh, let's say, take it as a working hypothesis of not-self, um, when you know the heart, when you know the world from a heart center, uh, it just does not feel like a self. You know, you're, when you're experiencing the amorphous, changing, vibrating nature 
of what it feels like to live inside of your thorax from the inside of your chest cavity uh, and what it feels like perhaps to even feel outside of that, yeah, this more expansive awareness, it does not feel like a self, you know, it just, uh, uh, and certainly you realize that you can't control it like a self. Yeah, for the most part, going about your days, um, you know, if we've got all our different faculties, um, if I'm not paralyzed, you know, I feel like I have a very uh, a fair amount of control over the world, but you can't change the feelings of the felt sense of a body. You can't, and you certainly can't change anything ex, uh, in the immediate vicinity around your body. You can't change the air molecules outside of your body. Um, there's just much less control when you have this expansive awareness from, from a heart center. It's like, huh? No, it's not really, not really a self. It's, it's impermanent. So whatever's impermanent, why would I take that as a self? And it just doesn't, uh, it doesn't have all the markers of selfing and ego that, um, yeah, normal everyday kind of knowing the world from behind the eyes, illusionary perspective that, oh yeah, it's me behind the eyes, me in here. And then it's the rest of the world out there. Um, yeah, you, those distinctions break down. And that's great because, yeah, just training in, in that flexibility is good in and of itself. And it helps us to question our own selfishness. It helps us question our own um, insecurities and uh, anxieties uh, because a lot of our anxiety is just a lot of it's just bodily or even like neurological. Um, but when you're knowing from a different spot, uh, you're just less tripped up by those things. And then the training in, uh, in dukkha, the training in the wisdom of seeing impermanence of things. Um, yeah. You've just got more spaciousness to move around and to be less moved by, uh, by pain when you realize that consciousness, the mind, can know experience from other places. I'm not stuck knowing the pain in my knee. I can actually shift awareness. I can literally move my awareness through that pain and see the insubstantiality of it. Or if it's just way too much, I can move attention to somewhere which is totally different. You know, if I'm having pain in my right knee, I can move my awareness to my left shoulder. And um, yeah, when you see that that's possible, you're just less trapped into uh, feeling like there's nothing to do about one's own, one's own suffering. So you've got more, more wiggle room. And just in general, um, the more comfortable you feel with the shifting of awareness or um, shifting of subjectivity, uh, then the more comfortable you feel with it and the more you can relax with it and just find an extreme stillness in the heart of that, of that knowing. Uh, and that just can just be more and more uh, psychologically stabilizing. Um, and when you've got this inner food, this inner nourishment, like, oh man, you know, it, it kind of uh, feels good, you know, to not be completely at the whims of my own triggers, basically. Um, yeah, the mind can be more spacious. Um, then that's an internal sustenance, and I don't have to like feed on all the, the junk food um, that, you know, our human habits of mind, human inclinations just oftentimes pull us to. It's like a, you have a, a smarter perspective to avert to. Um, so that's some thoughts. And for the people who raised your hand at the beginning that you didn't know what I was talking about, gosh, apologies. Um, hopefully maybe some of it made more sense because um, I definitely talked about it a lot. But maybe um, close up the reflections there and yeah. Hey, Wong. <laughs> Okay.
Okay, so we can um, yeah open things up for questions, and I think uh, today we were this um, head mic is being a little bit muffled these days, um, so maybe if people just wanted to uh, say their questions out loud, and then hopefully everyone here can hear it, and then I'll just repeat it for people on on Zoom, and yeah, just open things up in that way. Yeah, Sam. Can I mention your name for, okay. So Sam was just uh, mentioning that, um, yeah, appreciating this different perspective on non-dual Theravada, um, but then something which does feel like a self, and, and I agree, is uh, even if you can know spaciously, spaciously from different parts of the body, you can drop awareness, move awareness around, still that capacity to move awareness around, or even I would add, like the capacity to stay in one spot and know expansively, um, that can feel like a self. Um, and I, I agree that it can. Um, and for me, one aspect which is intermingled with that sense of self is a sense of conceit. At least that I, I experience that. Like, oh, I'm the one who can be the knowing. I am the beer of the knowing. You know, I'm the one who has the capacity to have the samadhi to stay with this capacity to know from a different part of the body, spaciously, three-dimensionally. Um, and that part is easier to kind of parse out as just being silly, I would hope. Yeah, for me, I see that and I'm like, that, that's silly. Like the conceit, that, that conceit is, is different from the sense of, of self. Like it seems like there could still be a sense of self that is able, or there could be a self which is moving the attention which wasn't bound up with that conceit or ego of like meditative skill so get rid of that meditative skill hopefully like all of us for um yeah i think the more one practices with this like way of non-dual theravada heart knowing like the more you see that conceit and the less it becomes like uh, a problem hopefully um but one still might be kind of attaching or still might have this sense of, of self. And that's very much, I think, like once you've cut the unwholesome, like conceit, ego-based thing out of it, like it feels like that, that's what could be the Atman, you know, in, in Hindu philosophy, like that which knows. Um, and yeah, I mean, just as a, on a working um, uh, pragmatic or like skillful means method, like, or skillful means of relating to the technique. Um, I don't think it would hurt to take that, like maybe there is a self, you know, put that as like in question marks, like yeah, before and afterwards, put one of those Spanish question marks beforehand. Um, but then, yeah, question, uh, maybe, maybe this could be a self. Um, and then, yeah, maybe it could be, maybe it's not. And then if, 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 if that's helpful, then actually writing it out and like actually maybe having some sense of identifying with that more spacious sense of self could be a skillful instrumental means to development in virtue, concentration, wisdom. Um, but then at some point, from a Buddhist perspective, the Buddha does say, keep looking, and perhaps you might find that that, that level of self actually becomes, might see, oh, actually, no, it, it doesn't make sense that that's a self. Or even if it did make sense, it's causing me suffering to hold on to it. Does that make sense or any? Yeah. Um, every time I hear or try and think through this question of who is the knower and those things, I'm reminded, I don't know if I have it right, but something like the Buddha saying, don't bother with these cosmological questions. Don't try to solve the philosophical questions 
And so I find myself just setting it aside. Is that consistent with your teaching of what you, or, or how, do you, how do you deal with that? what not to really try and pursue? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, Gary was just asking about, um, and if anybody did want to ask a question but didn't want their names said, I won't have to say your name, but um, Gary was just saying that, uh, yeah, the Buddha did have this category of questions which he did not answer. So at one point in another sutta, the Buddha says that uh, there are four ways to respond to questions you can either respond by silence, and he would do that at times, specifically, especially with relating, relating to these certain questions, which the more you go into them, the more proliferative and unhelpful they become. They're just like philosophical wormholes, basically, that just don't lead to the end of suffering. So the Buddha would remain quiet on those. So sometimes the Buddha would respond to a question with, with silence. Sometimes he would respond with a counter question. Um, so maybe asking you to define your terms. Sometimes he would respond uh, with a yes, no answer. So a categorical uh, yes, categorical no, categorical self, not self. Um, and sometimes he would respond with an analytical answer. So saying yes, but, or yes, and, or no, but, or yes, and, no, but. Um, <laughs> You know, so he had, he had really skillful means. He could do all of these. And I think just that is fascinating to know um, and to appreciate that you don't always have to answer every question and maybe asking counter questions are helpful and having people define their terms is useful. In that list, so there's a list of 10 subjects which the Buddha would put aside, didn't answer um, because they do lead to this kind of like proliferative soup of just infinite regress or like... Um, infinite feedback loop of I've got this view, competitive answer, response, I've got this new, this view. It's like chat GTP talking to chat GP, GPT forever, basically. Um, but for that, that list of 10, it's basically things like uh, the soul exists, or the world is eternal, uh, the world is not eternal, the world is uh, finite, the world is infinite, the soul exists inside the body, the soul exists outside the body, uh, or the self, sometimes it's translated as self, the word is jivita, so it's not atta in that, in that instance. So like the Buddha was very, pretty specific about how he used terms. So he wouldn't define this kind of jivita or life essence as, he wouldn't speak to that, you know, because apparently in his day, like speaking about the life essence would just lead to, um, you know, no good result. It's just basically everybody speculates and there's no answer to be found. Or even if there is, it's just not beneficial for letting go, which is the, the Buddhist touchstone. Um, and then, yeah, is, the, is there, does the Buddha exist after death? Does he not exist? He both exists, does not exist. So these different speculations or questions the Buddha didn't respond to. But he did talk about um, self and uh, atta, which is the atman, and the Pali equivalent of Atman, and Anatta, or not self, Anatman. And different scholars come to different conclusions on this. Ajahn Jeff, Ajahn Tanisro, says that uh, there is a sutta where the Buddha is asked directly, is there a self? Is there an Atta? And the Buddha does not reply, or he says, that's the wrong question. Um, so in that sutta, that would be evidence that the Buddha just would sometimes put aside the question. But you have other suttas, like the Anattalakana Sutta, basically historically like the second discourse that the Buddha gave where he says, yeah, is, is form permanent or impermanent? Is it suffering? Is it not suffering? Is that which is suffering uh, intangible, uh, impermanent? Is it worth saying, this is mine, I am this, this is myself? No, it's not. Um, so the Buddha could kind of take both tacks, I think, depending on who was listening. So um, yeah, maybe... Long answer just to say, yeah, realizing that there are different ways to answer questions and looking to that touchstone of like letting go and that touchstone of um, both inner personal, interpersonal, intrapersonal um, well being, benefit, letting go as being the overarching, like, okay, we're, 
you know, I, so I can't really say, should I talk about self or not self? Um, it seems like the Buddha sometimes would, sometimes wouldn't. Um, but just looking at what comes up in your daily life, the conversations, and then putting aside those which seem like they're just lead to so much speculation. Like I'm in university, I'm in a Buddhist university right now, and <laughs> it's just a pain point for me to see my own kind of infinite proliferative, I'm gonna one up the Mahayanist mindset. Oh, it's just horrible. <laughs> don't do it, don't do it, yeah. Um, so it's a good training. So just watching that, yeah, like, am I trying to one up? Is there, is there a re resolution? Like, am I or the person who I'm talking to actually reachable and then not going where it doesn't seem beneficial? Yeah, the question was about um, compassion um, and the scope of it. Is it, yeah, compassion for self and compassion for others and especially uh, compassion for oneself. And yeah, this is another arena where this um, non-dual or kind of dropped heart-based, heart-based knowing is especially useful to be able to practice with. I mean, in many different traditions, uh, Theravada, Mahayana, Hindu, Christian, um, probably yeah, many other non-religious groups. I mean, just like the heart center is almost the, the chakra for tapping into these Brahma Viharas or these divine abodes, loving kindness, compassion, gladness, um, equanimity. And so, yes, yeah, starting from that spot. And yeah, you know, the... You probably heard of the Tonglen Tibetan method of meditating where you like breathe in, like, um, like almost seeing other people's suffering kind of come into you and then breathing out, like experiencing or wishing that other person wellness, wishing them happiness, like wholesome mind states. One thing which you can do sometimes, one block for me for that practice of compassion is uh, that it's like sometimes like, I kind of don't want their bad energy, you know? Like I'm afraid if I take it in, and I've heard a, a Pali teacher say, that's a great teaching until you can actually do it. You know, like you take in, if you don't know how to absorb someone else's negative energy, then it can maybe mess you up. But one skillful means around that, which I found is this, when you find this spacious awareness that isn't necessarily, at least from a felt personal point of view, constrained within the body, you can imagine talking with someone, breathing in any dukkha that they're experiencing, coming not into your heart, but actually through your heart, behind you even, into the spacious awareness behind you. And then breathing out from the spacious awareness behind you, through your heart, back to them. And that way, uh, it's not stuck inside, stuck inside you. Yeah. Yeah, and similarly with like self, self-compassion, like similarly like breathing, um, maybe even compassion, if you're not having it for yourself, compassion, certainly other people wish you well. Hopefully you're surrounded by people and certainly in this room, there's a lot of you know, mutual well wishes, goodwill, and just letting that seep in, seep through you, and then, yeah, letting all that's good kind of come out as well, so, yeah. How does that sound? I think the battery's almost dead. But um, yeah, how does one, <laughs> well one neat thing about all of these problems
for us to wish ourselves well next show. Um, so yeah, just if that's the case, then yeah, accepting other people's well wishes and just breaking down the boundaries. There's a lot of language both in those Brahma Vihara chants. It's in the chanting book um, that we don't have with us, but basically there's a chant which is all abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness, compassion, gladness, equanimity, uh, pervading the front, sides, back, above, below, around, and everywhere. And to all as to myself, all abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with compassion and these others, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, immeasurable, apamana, without boundaries. And that's the same language which is used in this uh, non-dual um, uh, pericope or non-dual um, stock phrase you find in the canon, which I didn't mention in the talk, but which is, uh, it's framed in the context of what are called the kasin ayatanas. Kasina is totality, ayatana is sphere. Um, so the akasa, Kasinayatana, the sphere of the totality of space, or the sphere of totality of consciousness. And then what is that? It's a mind which knows above, below, all around, advayang, or non-dual, and apamanang, without limit, without boundary, abundant, exalted, and measurable. So being able to knock down those boundaries just when you're sitting alone by yourself, maybe not even practicing metta or karuna, um, but just being with that awareness and then yeah, bringing karuna in whichever way it needs to go. Oh, sorry. <laughs> hey, Michael, uh, did you have a question? I think we can hear you, maybe. Uh, can you hear me? All right. Yep, we got you. All right. Got you. All right uh, no question. I was just, uh, uh, may you and everyone there, may you all be health and peace. Nice. <laughs> okay. Um, well, it's 1050, so unless there are other... Um, questions. Maybe we can, um, yeah, maybe read out the blessing braid and if there were any other announcements that people had. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 